Hello and welcome into another edition of State of the Sun Devils, a post-game edition where the Sun Devils lose this one to Oregon. This was a must-win game, Jesse and Jake. Alongside Jake Anderson and Jesse Morrison, I'm Jeremy Schnell, first of all. Now, let's get to the game. Oregon came out firing in the second half, Jake, and it was no secret that ASU has been struggling in second halves lately. And uh, it, I, it, just, it just wasn't what we thought we were going to see today. And uh, it was unfortunate. I just want to get your thoughts on the second half as a whole. So as the second half was going on, I, I told Jesse this reminded me a lot of the UCLA game in which ASU was definitely in the game in the first half. And in the second half, the run that they allow their opponents to go on kind of puts them in that chasing the game for the rest of the second half. And a 14-4 Oregon run did that, exactly that. They, ASU never got the lead back. They got it down to one. They cut a 12-point lead down to one. But you went into halftime up three. And they, again, and I don't know how, they, they play defense so well for the first half and the second half. I mean, you're talking about 69% from three in the second half for Oregon, five of eight. You're talking about they're shooting 59% from the field in the second half. I mean, it, and then that coupled with the turnovers, the points off turnovers, the foul shots. I mean, I'm, I'm never going to be a big blame the refs guy, but Bobby, he was right. He kind of was a circus out there tonight. He did say that after the game, Jesse. He did say it was a circus after, uh, after the game. I, I wanted to get your thoughts on the officiating a as a whole, uh, what you thought of that. Obviously, we say this all the time, can't blame officiating. you got to go out there and just play ball. But there were a lot of fouls called in that second half. Yeah, you know, for me, I think that refs, especially in college, call way too many fouls. Just let players play. It's more fun. The The product on the court is better when you do that. Um, I've just kind of noticed a trend with ASU. Um, down the stretch of games, and it's been like this ever since I've watched Bobby Hurley's teams, it's just a lot of just emphasis on the calls from the sidelines, from the players, from everyone. And Control what you can control. So ASU ended up losing this one 75 to 70. They were down at one point. It was 73 to 70 with uh, under 10 seconds left. If we go back to the technical with nine minutes left, that could be a one-point game. And ASU would not have to have a corner three-pointer. Des got a good look there in the, in the corner. Uh, I'll show it on the screen right now if I can remember to put it in. He's a tall guy that can shoot over people it just didn't go and it happens he you know he didn't have a great game offensively he didn't score until i believe like the 10 minute mark of the second half or something along those those lines but i saw encouragement from his teammates from his coaching coaches because they know in order to win games they need des to get going jake yeah and if you didn't watch the game at all and i didn't tell you anything about it you would have thought des probably scored 20 again because asu scored over 70 points but that wasn't the case, obviously. DJ Horn, who we talked about pregame, was actually the one that led ASU in scoring and pretty much was the guy tonight, along with Frankie Collins. And one of the threes that would have been for the lead when it was 71-70 went to Luther Muhammad, who was two for three from three at the time. He was four for seven from the field, I believe, and he missed the, misses that shot. It, it's, it's just one of those games where... We can nick, nitpick every single one-point possession type thing. Um, one thing I do want to say just along the lines of the, the technical free throws, is, and Doug Tamaro made a good point of it, is they called a flop, I believe it was on Alonzo Gaffney, or it was when he, he hit the three. It was Muhammad, yeah. Okay, so, but they call a, so they call a flop, and it's a technical foul. And I, I'm kind of with Doug on it. Like maybe, like, maybe do a warning before you're just giving away points for it. I, I, but I get you're trying to get rid of it. It's just one of those rules in college basketball, right? So you got to live with it. But I am with Jesse. You got to control what you can control. And this one hurts because I don't see a way ASU is going to be able to make the NCAA tournament now um, just with what they got at the end of the year with two LA schools and, and U of A on the road. I would like to say that a lot of this did not have to do with them, ASU not getting. Uh, or getting too, you know, involved in caring about the refs. I would say that a lot of it had to do with the the end of the first half into the second half, the start of the second half. Um, there was a lot of, uh, you know, the 
uh, Oregon hit a three going into the half, and then they kind of just went on a run. We've seen ASU um, give up a lot of points at the start. Starts They start well in the first half and don't start well in the second half. We've seen that uh, many times this year. Um, so I, I felt like that, you know, in addition to maybe a little bit of the chaos down the stretch just kind of led to this. Um, but, you know, hats off to Oregon for playing a good game. They lost by a lot of points to this team earlier this year. They got some good players. They might be a tournament team. They're 14 and 10 now. They have a better record in the Pac-12 than ASU. So, I mean, th again, this is a big loss for ASU. They needed this game. Now they, they, they're going to have to beat, like, maybe both L.A. schools in L.A. or a U of A. Like it, it's a tough road. They might have a lot of wins at the end of the season, over 20 wins, and not make the tournament. Yeah, I mean, they. I only see one game that could be potentially a quad one win for ASU left, and that's Utah. And that might not end up being a quad one win by the time we get to that game. Um, and then you got the three, the three schools at the end of the year with UCLA, U USC, and U of A, where it's going to be so tough to win those games on the road. And you just you needed to these la the last six games you needed to win at least five of them, and they lost five of them. Yeah, losing to the two LA schools was not necessarily the end of the world. But once they lost to both Washingtons, and now they just split with Oregon. I mean, they needed a season sweep over Washingtons. They needed a season sweep over Oregon's. I mean, just to have a prayer now. They got to win out, or at least, you know, like, at this point, like we talked earlier in the week, at this point, I would just take every game as if it is a tournament game. Because essentially it is. Because if, if they were to lose to a Cal or a State, like literally anybody that isn't UCLA or Arizona, that, that, that's it. I, I think it's curtains. All right, I got a crazy idea for you guys. So today, at this game, they honored two teams. The 2003 uh, tournament team that had uh, Kyle Dodd, who's the radio play-by-play -play guy, does a great job. Um, they, uh, Ike Diagu was on that team as well. Still playing pro at 39 years old in Venezuela, so shout out to him for still getting it done. And then they honored the ASU's best men's team of all time, uh, the 1962-63 team, which had Joe Caldwell on it, and yeah, he's up there. He's up. So is Ike. So is Ike. They're both up there. Uh, we're, we're pointing at the jerseys. They're like they're they're honored. They're not retired, but it's it's basically like having your jersey retired. But anyway, Joe Caldwell is Marcus Bagley's grandfather, and Marcus Bagley just happened to be here, still on the ASU roster. Here's my thing. Why doesn't Bobby Hurley give him a call, you know, patch things up, bring him back? He's a hell of a player. Why not? Well, no, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but uh, You should ask him next time. <laughs> next time we get a chance, we'll talk to him uh, about it. Tough loss. I, I just didn't want to ask him at that point. But, like, he was here. Um. Let's get back into what the road ahead looks like for ASU. They got Colorado and Utah coming up. Um, home games? Yeah, home games, right? Yeah, they're going to be here. Mm -hmm. They also so. have to go to Stanford and Cal. Yeah, that's right. That's this, ne that's this coming week, huh? Yeah, so, yeah, so it splits it up. Home and then finish with the three ways. Yeah, women's is home this weekend, Cal, Stanford. Men are on the road at Cal, Stanford. You got to win both those games. Those, both are winnable games. Cal and Stanford are not very good teams, even though Stanford did beat this Oregon team uh, recently. Um, you need to win the next four in a row for sure, both the Bay Area and Mountain schools. And then hopefully you beat USC. I don't expect them to beat UCLA or U of A. And then you got to win two tournament games. Hopefully you can lose to UCLA or U of A in the semifinals of the Pac-12. I mean, that's and, and that won't that might not be enough, but that's where we're at. Yeah, uh, well, we talked about how they're they're in a position now where they're not going to get that bye. So that could eventually help them by having more games in the Pac-12 tournament if they're able to get past the first round and move into the next Winning round. Winning the Pac-12 tournament actually might be the only way at this point. I, stranger things have happened. Oregon State won the Pac-12 tournament a couple years ago. That's true, but that's how they made it. Yeah. And they made a deep run. Yeah. So don't forget that. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, they went to the Elite Eight. Again, like I've said, it's really just not that hard for anyone to get to the Sweet 16. <laughs> All right. Um, I want to touch on the defense real quick before we get out of here. Because in the first half, I was like, wow, defense looks great. They're flying around even better than what they look like in the Oregon State game. Uh, at one point, it was like, I think it was 13 to 9 for a while. And ASU just couldn't get the ball in the hoop. It, and Oregon couldn't get the ball in the hoop, and everybody was missing shots. And I'm like, if ASU could just make shots right now, they can get out to a big lead to start the game. And that's where it kind of got tricky because Oregon just kept fighting back and fighting back, and it was a three-point game at the end of the first half, and then Oregon just went on a run, and, you know, that was it. Yeah, you know, the defense was good in the first half, but I'm just going to go through all the teams in the history of college basketball that have made the Sweet 16 and just throw out all the random team names for you guys. <laughs> Florida Gulf Coast. <laughs> it's not that hard, right, Jake? Yeah, you just have to be the best 16 team in the country. Out of 300, how many? Florida Gulf Coast was not a best 16 team in the country. Come on. They were that year. Uh, um, as you can see over Jesse's left shoulder, um, Arizona Sports, we're the local sports leader. You can check out ArizonaSports.com to see Jake's article from this game and future games. Jesse's writing for uh, a couple future games coming up as well. Um, and you can also find us on Twitter at AZ Sports Devils. Um, and uh, for the station account, you can go to AZ Sports. There will be stuff on there with Suns, Cardinals, as well as this ASU team and all ASU teams as well. For Jesse Morrison and Jake Anderson, I'm Jeremy Schnell. We'll talk to you in the la later in the week.